Well, greetings. Thank you very much. Um, you can all hear me in the back. Excellent. Uh, it's a real, real pleasure to, to be here. Um, uh, the kind of background, quick background to, to the relationship we have here um, is that we've been communicating by email and it's amazing how much energy can be con con communicated with an email. And when I, the first email I sent Alex, his email went, wow, great, fantastic. And, I thought, and that's not some of, the, some of the emails that I get back are not normally as infused as that. I think it's a real testament to people who have a core, a real integrity, a real understanding of what it is that they do and want to share it. Um, and that for me is, brings me here. I want to share what I want. I want to share the sort of things that I, that I know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, as I was saying to Alex, that the Simran lecture is something I started in 2010. And really it's about, it was my understanding and my research around eldership, around intergenerational work. I've been doing intergenerational work for almost 20 odd years with young people, different communities, etc., etc., And it became kind of obvious, really, that our elders, the cornerstones of our communities, are not being supported or are not investing. Or those, that social capital is not happening. Why is it happening? That was my question. And so therefore, the lectures came out of that. Um, so you're probably, you're going to get the most up-to-date, trimmed version of these lectures. So I hope you bear with me. And this, in fact, for me, the lectures are about a conversation. So if there are things that you wish to raise, please tell me. If there are things that you're not quite sure, please tell me. This is a conversation. In the spirit of the Ragged University, we are having a conversation. Uh, just because I put that there doesn't mean I'm an expert. It just means I've spent a lot more time doing it. So I would really invite you to do that. Now, before I start doing the lecture, it is a tradition in my, from where I come from, to ask the elder in the audience that I can have permission to speak. So, can I have an elder give me permission to speak? Who's going to admit to being an elder? <laughs> 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 Thank you. It's really important because, from my tradition, elders are the cornerstone. They are the people that ensure that you have clarity in where you're going. They give you the support, the network, the knowledge. And for me, being a storyteller is passing on that, that hidden knowledge that comes through stories. My parents, my grandparents, my uncles are always giving me knowledge. And when I was very young, they kept giving me knowledge in proverbs, lots and lots of proverbs, becoming more and more frustrating because the proverbs, I couldn't understand what they meant. All right. So um, <clears throat> one of the things I spoke to you about is that my auntie would say to me, an empty bag doesn't stand up. I said, well, what does that mean? An empty bag doesn't, what does that mean? What does that mean? And she just goes, yeah. <laughs> so I'll be kind of frustrated for days. And it took about maybe 20 years for me to understand what that meant. And what it meant is an empty bag, something that doesn't have substance, doesn't last. It can't sustain itself. I said, ah! And it clicked one day at school. One day at, uh, when I was working in the local authority, running a big department and realizing that's what it meant. So anyway, let me just skip through the initial bits. These are the people that that have supported me. Um, okay, so now this is the conversation. Our elders are made children, and how does this happen? Is anybody uncomfortable with that at the moment? Yes, I'm uncomfortable. I don't understand it. Good. Excellent. Due to the impact of advertising and the degradation of values in our present society, our elders are shoehorned into uh, roles that are entirely inappropriate, merely 
consumers and not, as the good book says, human souls. Because the paramount attribute of a human being, I think this is a common all that the humans are souls, parts of God. Now, if we deny the God in ourselves and one another, civilization ceases to be. Because we're mere very intelligent animals, predatory, cats on the face of the earth. But if we accept that all of us are souls uh, to improve one another, then we become the God brain. Wow. Wow, can we give that man an applause, please? That's pretty impressive. Thank you very much, sir. This is slide one. Thank you. It is a very irksome question. Why are elders and made children? How does this happen? Well, I'm going to try and unwrap that for you. I'm going to try and do that. And if at any point you feel, mm, I will unwrap some more. All right? And that's exactly how the conversation should happen. Okay, opening paragraph. The two most important days of your life are the day you are born and the day you find out why. That's not my quote, Mark Twain. I think that's a fantastic quote. I became a storyteller, I was saying to Alex before. It was an amazing epiphany for me. I've been writing for about 30 odd years. Went to Ghana. Not quite sure why, but I wanted to go there. I've been reading about it, spent a lot of time understanding Africa, etc., etc. And I went to a place called El Mina, which was of gold. And that's where, where the captives were being held before they were placed on ships to go and be distributed across the world. Now, I went there because I wanted to understand. I'd read so much. I understood it. I thought I'd made the connection, but I was there. Someone was going to tell me what was going on. Unfortunately, I was being, I was part of a group of people that had the guide gave us a sanitized version of what happened. And I said to him, I don't want a sanitized version. I want to know, you live here, tell me. And I had to badger him for about half an hour after everybody left. And then he began to tell me some of the horrific things that actually happened. Stuff you're not going to read about. Stuff that no one will tell you. And at the point at which I understood that, that's when I was in total pain. Traumatized. I would not wish that sort of trauma on anyone. Having pain that emanates from inside and goes outside, and there's no way you can stop it. <coughs> and I sat in a place called the room, the place of no return. And in this place, all the Africans that had been captive were placed here, ready to go on the ships. And there's a door about so big. And if you were sufficiently malnutrition, if you were sufficiently thin and weak, you could go through it. So that acted as a matrix, as a, as a matrix to go through and come out of it. <coughs> and when I realized how that that could have been my great, 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 great grandfather, that just added to the trauma. And I sat in this place crying, complete pain. And in that time, a small multicolored bird came in, flew in, sung, and the mountain, the singing just filled the space, and it perched just inside that space, singing. And then when it left, I felt completely light, and I stopped crying. And I realized that that moment, out of the most horrific things, can come beauty. And I came back to London as a storyteller. And I realized that was my mission. That was why I was on the planet. <coughs> and that's why I'm here to you today. This is not something I just do. It's something I am. My point of sharing, my point of sharing that is to say that I love what I do. I love information. I love the conversation. I want to learn. I want to give. That's how I'm set up. So it's a pleasure for me and a privilege to stand before you today. 
I know why I'm doing, I'm doing. <coughs> That was a, a quick snapshot of the book, a children's book that I'd written, which I'll go back to if you really want to, to but I'm not here to sell anything at all. So what is an elder? And I'm making a dis distinction between elderly and older person. Okay. And I can see another confu confusion at the back, but I'll open it up for you. Okay. Old, waiting for death. Elderly, becoming a child. Don't know if you can read that. <coughs> no? On one side, it's got this baby, and it's got youth, diaper, drool, shorts, wrinkles, gas, burps, soft food, babbling, naps, ball, and gums. And then the other side, it's got old age, and it's got exactly the same list. That's not what I mean. Let me uh, just sort out a clip for you, if that's okay. I think this is a, a beautiful clip, and I'm hoping that that will spark some conversation. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We were all meant to shine as children. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same as we are liberated from our own fear. Our presence automatically liberates others. Sir, I just want to say thank you. You saved my life. Thank you, sir. I urge you to get the book. I urge you to get the film. You have a copy? Oh, yes. Well done. Of the book? Of the film. Of the film. Of the film. Any review on it. Absolutely. See this woman. Mm -hmm. That was good. I, from that film, I learned to call myself fabulous. Yes. Absolutely inspiration. The thing that holds us back, we need to put that right up at the beginning of this conversation is fear. We're going to work through that during this conversation. Anybody see this? What's written here? You, sir. It's a person with a pen. Me, me. Excellent. Yeah. Well, absolutely. <laughs> Every way you do that. Okay, so let me, let me posit what I think the definition of an elder is. An elder and some of this stuff will come, you'll be able to see most of this in the dictionary. People of greater age or venerable, venerable because of age. Can you see some? Okay. Person of advanced life, person, a member of Senate or governing body, and an official, all right? Now the words I just want to, to highlight are venerable, advanced life, governing body, and official, right? These are quite powerful words. 
Venerable, advanced life, governing body, and official. And I use these images deliberately to take it out of the, the church and the other bits that, that might be associated with it. I can always come back to slides. Now, in my conversations, in my research, I'm saying, well, is this the same everywhere else? Am I the only person thinking this? Now, First Nations, their understanding of an elder is we are helpers. That is the highest level we can be. We are part of the family. They see themselves as integral. So if people have a problem, they go to an elder. If they need something, they will send their children to an elder. It is not something that they, is an afterthought. It's something that is in the fabric of how they are as people. Something else. Is this the same anywhere else? This is Nigeria. Babu Yawa. From him, the elders through earthly and spiritual wisdom provide a supportive backdrop for those on the quest for knowledge and self. Okay. This is coming from Nigeria, but can people recognize someone that they would say, this is a, an important person to me, that's helping me to find myself? Is that recognizable? I met a gentleman who died of still disease, and he was blind, who was an elder, though he was eight years younger than me. His name was Dr. Roy Green, from near Birmingham, and he put my mind at rest over a very delicate matter that bothered me to death. He was, um, Psychologist in charge of a unit for uh, dealing with children, and he ran a group of a community, a fellowship of disabled people, uh, who went on trips uh, like a canal cruise. Don't look blind, he was the most radiant person I've ever met. It was a gift from God, Dr. Lloyd. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So it's recognizable that this is Nigeria. And the other place was recognizable, was from Canada. So with this something, there is a seed somewhere that's about the structure of who we are and how we are as people, as human beings. Yes? That's what I'm trying to do. As people, as human beings. And I'm going to switch this phone off because I'm not going to have people ringing me in the middle of this talk. It's recognisable. Now, this is part of the Canadian Journal Native Study, 1996. It is updated, but it's exactly the same words that are in there. And this is what they use for their people. Elders should be teachers because of their wisdom, advisors, lawgivers, dispensers of justice, knowledgeable in all aspects of culture. How many of you feel that this is you? Uh, without being good, I'll introduce you to somebody who is my leading character. I think he pronounced to that. He's a Welsh headmaster of a place you won't find in that Abercam, I'm Charles the Capital here. And I'll provide you with uh, any uh on the medics, the essay about Adam Moyle and Wright. Okay, sir, thank you. Are there any other elders in here that would identify themselves as elders <laughs> and say, actually, yes, I'm a teacher? I'm an advisor, I'm a dispenser of justice, I'm knowledgeable in most aspects, aspects of my culture. I'm just about to say Excellent. an inspiring elder, but Absolutely. I'm still learning. Absolutely. No, I didn't say you weren't learning, I was saying, would you identify? Mm -hmm. Good. One, two. In my last year in employment, I felt people didn't have to be in that Excellent. That is so good. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Remember I put this word up here? Fear. Actually, what I'll do is make it a bit bigger. All right? So you've got fear. And what I'm going to do is going to move it over here so it's right in front of you. All right? You can see the word right there. Okay. Three people recognize that. Now, I'm going to take you through what I believe are seven stages of eldership. Now, we've got a small bit, so I'll read them individually. Right? <coughs> now, there may not be, may, you may have a, an issue with it. That's great. Let's have that conversation. But these are the seven things that I think are quite important. 
Right. Now I'll go, I'll just go through all seven of them and show you that actually they do exist as a cycle. Now, first stage, taking the leap from an adult to an elder requires time spent within your community and other communities and an acknowledgement of your acquired experiences. All right? All that means is you're taking that leap. You're having a view about yourself. You're trusting yourself. What do you have inside you? I have got this information to share. It is important. I value it. Now, why is that important? I I'm, do work as a narrative coach. Right? What that means is I use story to help people gain perspectives in their lives. Every person I work with, that is probably the most common thing. I don't trust myself. And my initial starting point is, I'm working with you because you already have what you need. All I'm going to do is help you gain access to it. And it takes six sessions of all the people I've worked with, it always takes six sessions before they can say, ah, I can trust myself. And I even put it in the contract that I have with them. I will trust you more than you trust yourself. And I will believe in your dreams even when you don't believe in them. That's in the contract. And I say, you're going to have to sign that. And they sign it. And day one, they don't believe in themselves. Day two is the same thing. Day three is the same thing. And it only gets six sessions in before they say, ah, I actually have some knowledge. I say, you've always had that. It's about taking that leap. And part of what I am, part of what my work is, is about reflecting back at you and saying, you actually have that to make sense of your life. Now, once you've gained that knowledge and trust in yourself, you can enable other people to trust themselves. If you don't do that for yourself, you will never do it for someone else. Am I making any sense here? If I'm not making sense, you tell me, please. So it's taking that leap. And you will have done that, sir, when people have come to you. And they're coming to you and you are giving them information and support because you trust what you have. Your knowledge. Is that the same, sir? You trust what you have. Okay. Second stage. Knowledge of self and others. It's not just trusting but actually believing that you have something to give, something of value. Giving the time and energy for preparation of others to come. So if the averages will say, I am not plowing this land for me, I'm plowing it for my children. So when I do this sort of work, it is not for me that I do it. Because once I've given you that information, my hope is that that energy will replicate itself elsewhere. So it will, you will be able to take that information and pass it on. That's what energy is. Positive energy given to you, you pass that on. This is one example of it. Another example, if you get up in the morning and you walk, you're walking to work or wherever you're going to go, you smile at somebody, they smile at you. That's positive energy. Guaranteed, the next person that walks past them, they'll smile. And so on and so on. And your one smile may have affected at least a hundred people that day. It may have in fact changed the life of one person that day. Please come and sit down, sir. I'm glad to see you. Glad to see you. So this is becoming quite serious now. Not only we're trusting ourselves, but we believe the things that are within us that we have gained throughout our lifetime is worth sharing. And, and as part of that, we have to actively give that energy. Remember we talked about earlier, we talked about the soup, the um, 
First Nations Charter is talking about that they see themselves as part of the family, that the family goes to them. So we're spending time and energy enabling those people to find our opinions. Okay, so the question that they then ask is, who am I? Third, knowledge of the ancestors and your history. Knowledge of nurturing others and acknowledging the unknown. Well, I had this amazing conversation with my son two days ago. He says, you always talk about ancestors, ancestors, what does that mean? I said, okay, half past 12, I'll be working for 15 hours, and he wants to have this deep philosophical conversation. He's on holiday, I'm not. I'm saying, well, okay, what, what do you think an ancestor is? It's just a man. Your grandfather passed away. Yeah. He's become an ancestor. Yeah. It's as simple as that. It's not rocket science. So when I say at the beginning of when I'm going to do talks, I say, thank God for the ancestors. Because if it wasn't for them, I would not be standing here today. And I'm not just talking about my father or my grandfather or my great-grandfather. I'm talking about thousands of years of people who have sacrificed and given them, sacrificed themselves in many different ways for me to be able to stand here. That is a privilege. And I don't, for one minute, every day of my life, I thank God for that. I thank the Creator. And I thank them for giving me the space to be able to talk to you today. So that knowledge makes me aware that I am very, very tiny. I'm a very small cog. I'm not that important. This is temporary. Tomorrow I may not exist. So what I've got to do now, I've got to share what I can. And I've got to understand how, how important it is to share. Knowledge of nurturing others, the Buddha says, or even Dalai Lama says, if you can't, if you're, if you're going to hurt somebody, if you feel you're going to help, don't do anything. Try and help people. And it is in the understanding of who you are, what knowledge you have, and how you can share that, that you are nurturing people. The very words that come out of your mouth are important. Now, as a storyteller, I recognize the energy that I give. Please come in. Please take a seat. I'm happy to see you. There is a story about two wolves. I'm sure some people may have heard it. Yes? The grandfather, the grandfather, the child, the, the grandson says to the grandfather, he wants to hear this story of the two wolves. The grandfather says, you know, there are two wolves. One's evil, blood dripping from his fangs. He's full of despair and anger. And there's another wolf who's full of love and compassion and understanding. And the grandson says, you've told me they're fighting each other all the time. He says, yes. And the grandson says, which one wins? And the grandfather says, whichever one you feed the most. Quite a powerful story. Whatever you do with your life, if you do not respect it and value it, you're feeding something else. It is as simple as that. If you respect and understand the knowledge that you have and the responsibility is to share, then you're feeding something else. If you don't do it, if you don't do it, then you're depriving someone else of the knowledge and the experience and the depth of philosophy that you've accumulated over a period of time. Why do that? There are people to be helped. I trained as a youth worker. There are young people out there that are looking for you. They're looking for you. Their parents haven't had that. And their parents' parents haven't had that. And they're looking for someone, something, some knowledge to say, stop what you're doing and think. As a youth worker, 
I believed I was doing important work. Other youth workers, when they're working with young people who are smoking, would say they'd sit down and, and smoke with them. Not good. <coughs> Not good. They'd sit down and let them smoke next to them. Not good. I would say, don't smoke next to me because it makes me sick. But you're a youth worker, you're paid to, to listen to us, to sit down and smoke with us. No, I'm not. I'm not paid to damage my health, but I'm paid to help you. Immediately what I'm doing, I'm creating, I am not a child, I'm an elder. And you have to respect me in that way. I'm demanding respect. Please, oh, please don't stand there. Please come and look. And the last bit of that, in terms of acknowledging the unknown, acknowledging the unknown. I do that when I'm teaching storytelling. People are very frightened when they sit in a classroom or a session that I'm at, because they have no idea what's going to happen next, which is great. I love that. Bless you. In the unknown, that place that you cannot quantify. You cannot tell what's going to happen. You cannot control it. That's me. I live in that space. Elders, there was one, one story that um, I went to a particular elder and I said to them, oh, look, I need to do this, 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 this. I'm, I'm running out of time. Like, and the elder said, do one thing. Everything else will work. But I said, I've got all these things to do. Said, do one thing and everything else will work. I could not see the unknown. For me, you need to control that. But the elder was saying to me, don't worry about that. You focus on this. And this will work. And I did. And it did work. That's the important thing, trusting that elder. Fourth stage, taking responsibility for one's life, making choices and walking in the choices you've made. This is fairly straight explanatory. Taking responsibility for your life is not anybody else's problem. It is something that you need to deal with. Taking responsibility for it. Making your choices and walking in the choices you've made. That will come up later in the conversation. Does anybody, has anybody um, watched The Matrix? Who's a Matrix fan? One, two... <laughs> Three, fear, don't worry about it, it's fine, it's fine. Oh, was that you as well? No, you're just rubbing your nose. Okay. <laughs> Brilliant, I'm going to make a lot of allusions to The Matrix. If you haven't seen The Matrix, see this woman here. <laughs> I have that one as well. Do you have that one as well? Okay. So I can't call you a woman, what's your name? Dory. Dory, yeah, see Dory. All right, The Matrix is a film you need to see and it has so many different levels to it. Have you seen The Matrix, Alex? Yeah, really. There you go, Alex. I, I, I knew you'd seen it, I just had to ask the question. Fifth stage, understanding your fear and giving away influence and power. The society is not set up to give away things. That's not how it's set up. That's why the ragged talks here are critical because what we're not, I'm giving this stuff away, right? But I believe it needs to be give, given away. Because who else is going to benefit from it? People beyond me. But I firmly believe that if I give this away, more will come. I have that complete, complete conviction that I give that away, stuff will come. And then I'll give away more and stuff will come. And I'll give away more and more and more and more stuff will come. That's the opposite of how the society is set up. You hold on to more. Don't give it away because somebody else will get something from you. I don't really care because I know what I'm doing is important. And I'm grounded in that. Now, the two stages here is the storytelling and the see beyond the physical. Is it something I've said? 
No, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> no, that's okay. No problem. The storyteller and see beyond the physical. Well, storyteller. Storytelling is simply being able to pass on that knowledge in a way that people can understand. Yes? Really, really important. Passing on that knowledge so people can understand. And to be able to see beyond the physical is not just in the unknown bit, but to be able to say, this is important. This is important now. Don't worry about what's going to happen there. This is important. Okay, so those are the, the setups. That's the bit there. Are there any questions before I go on? Because I, I do love this stuff, so I can keep talking to you. Yes, sir. I mean, I absolutely accept everything you're saying. Wow, <laughs> okay, great. But I can't help but feel there's another strand to as well. There's that, sorry? Another strand to okay. as well, because what you are talking about there is the process of self-development, which is fine. But I also feel that sometimes eldership is not about how you see yourself, but about how other people see you, which is a different kind of strand. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we're going to unlock that a little bit later on. We're going to do that. So, that was the seven stages. Anybody want a break? No? Is that a break? Sorry? No, I'm cool. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. People want to continue? Yeah. All right. I have this is this is, this is fun. I have a great thing when I'm working with with an audience. Right? They always do with a, a young group of people. They always want to do. Oh, that was really good. I don't want that. Sorry. I don't want any applause at all. Nothing at all. Can you just do this? Hey. Hey. Wow. All right. This is it. I'm going to come and do something to somebody now. <laughs> she said, "No." <laughs> She's running away. Don't do that. Don't do it. All right. One, two, three, hey! hey. Yes, everybody. <laughs> hey! Hey! Oh, hey. <laughs> Love it. Hey. Thank you. We just want to special with us. I know, just on your own. Just on yourself. <clears throat> it's really important. I think you've got to be part of what's going on, really part of this conversation. There is. <coughs> Actually, I'll tell you what, there's a story. Do you want a story? Yes? There's only about five people. Yes? Yes. Thank you. (laughs) Kofi was a frog. And he sat on this lovely green spongy lily pad that floated in this calm, calm mirror-like. And he sat with his four friends. He went, Rebe, Rebe, Rebe. Thank you. And he sat there with his friend. And the sun climbed high in the sky. And the moon climbed above it and pushed it into the lake. Now one day, (coughs) Kofi said to his friend, why do we say it? And his friend said, I don't know, we've always done that. His second friend said, well, I don't know, we've always done that. And his third friend said, yes, I know, but we've always done that. And Kofi thought and, thought and thought and thought and thought and thought and thought some more until he said, I'm going to find out why we say ribbit. And he jumped off the knee from the distance. That day, that evening, the sun was The next day, as the sun climbed out of the blue lake and swam to the center of the sky, three friends heard, Ba-ribe! 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 First Fred said, that wasn't me, I didn't do that. The second Fred said, that wasn't me, I didn't do that. And the third friend said, that wasn't me, I definitely didn't do that. And then they said, Baribit, Baribit, Baribit. And they did that until the sun sizzled into the lake 
and the silver moon floating in the velvet sky. I love that story. I told that story to my son when he was about five in order to help him get an understanding of how to lose your fear. I don't give morals to stories because the moral comes from everybody else. The story is different for everyone. For me, there are the stages which you began to talk about, sir. Now, is this transmission of wisdom, you know, the birth of wisdom to birth, this kind of cycle, which is what we're beginning to unpack, how people see themselves. For me, there's a whole set of currencies that have to happen in order for eldership to make sense. Can you see that? Yeah? Child wisdom. And I use this symbol because it's an adinkra symbol. It means perfection. So what I'm saying is people who recognize the wisdom within themselves are perfect. You're already perfect. There's nothing that needs to be added to you. And that's why people are coming to you. Because you had the knowledge to help them become perfect or recognize their own perfection. So I don't believe anybody become, is imperfect. I think we're all perfect. And what happens is that we just need to recognize that. So the first bit here, I love this picture. It's called a band. Baobab tree. And what these trees do is that they're all individual trees, but they all grow together. And these roots that come down from the trees not only feed that tree, but feed all the other trees. So they exist as a community. Now, if that wasn't a good advert for the ragged university, I don't know what is. Everyone in this space is feeding everyone else. Literally and mentally and spiritually. Just by being here, you're making this thing possible. This for me is one of the first things that we need to acknowledge as part of our responsibility in gaining our wisdom. Now we had that at the beginning, but it's really important to have that here now. Now, the idea of cultural knowledge, cultural knowledge, which is something that you need to gain, you need to go out and get it, it's not going to just come to you. Now, one of the things that I keep referring back to Alex, that the work that he's done is about making sure that, this, that the knowledge that's out there is available to you, but it's also a responsible responsibility for you to make that knowledge available to other people. Yes? Now, that's, that's a currency in itself. I'm using the word currency deliberately here. Not money, but this being currency. And if we begin to move our programming away from dollars and pound signs and move it into things like understanding our own culture, understanding ourselves, this is currency. Yes? And so if you recognize this as already being inside you, you are exceptionally wealthy already. If you are perfect, you are already wealthy. So you have something to give away, whether you like it or not. Does that make any sense? Oh, yes, indeed so. Now, when I introduce you to my uh, <coughs> uh, headmaster, I'll make it plain. I'll give you the memory stick, the, the things on the memory stick, the top third, you, you have 15 essays. Wow. Can you do that to Alex? Well, I did my memory yeah. stick. Well, not right now. But to Alex. I did my memory stick. I have two memory sticks. Okay. Crammed capacity with what I have created. Wow. I define myself by what I create, not David Seagrave, the little uh, Englishman with the wooden leg, but uh, the spirit to gush it out beyond the golf course within me, that uh, when I sit down with the word verse, so what is within me, what God provided, manifest on text and on memory stick. Wow. 
You've got a great audience here, man. Uh, whether you agree with my... Uh, no, I'm, I'm not here to disagree with you, sir. But I, but I agree with the thing that you're saying. It's coming from within. It's, a, it's that perfection that's yeah. being... Yeah. So it's exactly what you're saying. Okay, currency of historical position. What, that, what we're talking about here is recognizing actually that you are making history when you sit here. I am making history. What I'm doing here is making history. Right? And so you have a responsibility. It is not good enough for you to be, to go to a place and say, I'm just dropping in. Or you have a responsibility. Here you have a responsibility. What you're going to hear tonight, you have a responsibility to share. I believe this is historic. So don't, I don't have the choice not to be 100% above my game. I do not have the luxury of getting something wrong because I know that what I'm doing here is so critical and so important and could affect people and young people long after I've gone. So I don't have the luxury of getting it wrong. That here is the clay mosque in my life. The way they built that, I'm not going to go into it, but it's remarkable. And that's been there, I think, 2,000 years. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong. Currency of thought and creativity. You mentioned that a little bit, sir. The thought and creativity. What you think and how you create are important. Who's, who's aware of Ken Robinson's work? Excellent. Excellent. We stifle creativity, and we don't just do it. When I say we, I'm talking about systems of education. It's set up to do that. Nothing wrong with that. It doesn't, I can't, I, I try and change, challenge that all the time. But it does that. It challenges creativity to the point at which people can't feel that they cannot be creative. The brain is set up in such a way that it is, it actually is able to ask the question, what if? That's the creative bit. That's the power of who we are. When we ask the question, what if? We're into that creative knowledge. When we don't ask that creation, that creativity question, what if? All we're doing is maintaining a presence. Does that make any sense? What if? Yes. Yeah, I, all I want to is what if. Good. Uh, what if uh, uh, Freud psychoanalyzed Adolf Hitler and sent Hitler on a journey uh, to America and when Hitler was pushed out of the train at Stafford. That's the substance of the story I wrote. Okay. Uh, where uh, the third, the second world war is made between Britain, Germany, France, and the Emperor Charlemagne III. And what if Charles de Gaulle created himself? Emperor Charles Mine III of France and adjacent countries in 1940 and uh, sent uh, brave raids, not fine books, to bomb England and Germany. Okay. It's subject to one of my stories. Okay. Wow. Freud psychoanalyzed Hitler and then gave him the steam of that moment to Boston. And Hitler was pushed out of the train of tobacco and that one was the start of the first world war between Britain and France. Wow. Now that's the story of the plot, but it's really a really fun story. I'm going to have a conversation with you afterwards. Yes. Yes. Thought and creativity. Precisely what it is that we do and how we do it is in itself a currency. In the work that I do when I'm teaching story or storytelling <coughs> or creative writing, people come to me because they feel they've lost their, their creativity. You can never lose that. It's impossible. It is programmed, you are programmed not to accept that it still exists in you. Who is a writer or a poet in your view? I can sort of uh, create compulsive writer, more short stories than perhaps either Mo Pessel or Edgar Allan Poe. Wow. I've lost track of them. There must be hundreds. There must be. And I think everyone in here. If I was doing a creative writing course here, everyone would say they were a poet at the end of it. 
Why? Because you're already that. You think, oh, I can't use words, I can't do that, but you are. Remember what I said to you at the beginning? You're already perfect. You just have to find it. Now, this other bit is internal energy. This is going to take us a little bit into the unknown. We all have a way of communicating with each other right? beyond this physical stuff. Right? We all have a way of being able to interpret and read each other in such a way that we can support each other. Okay. She's, I can see you thinking, hmm, I'm not really sure if that makes any sense. Is that what you're saying, sir? Mm-hmm. Yes. No, I'm talking. What are you saying? Okay. Internal. Okay. Internal energy, which is about when you feel good about yourself, you can help others feel good about you. It's as simple as that. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. If you're walking around feeling negative about yourself, you will make other people feel negative. Because that's the starting point. If I walk around with a smile, <coughs> things are going to happen differently. If I walk around like this, things are going to happen differently. That, that woman, sorry, what was the last woman that came in? I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. How did you feel when I came? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you feel when you opened the door for the first time? Here. Yes. You felt, how did you feel? <coughs> felt a bit anxious? A bit worried? That's okay, it's okay, it's good. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Internal energy, energy, isn't it? We all have that ability to make people feel good. We all have that. We've got to start from that point. Yes? It's, what I'm saying here for me is something that I've done myself. So, As soon as you walked through the door, you were welcomed and you felt it was cool. And we have to practice that every day. And the last thing that I need to play is the currency of connectedness. What that means is, and you've got that here at the beginning, that we make an effort to connect with people. I enjoy being with people. I think that my enjoyment is not just about listening to people. So when I work in the hospital, the people who have severe neurological issues or amputations or strokes, I connect with them. Not because our poor patient, but I connect with them because I have something to learn from you. And I have a way of trying to get that information. And I can share with you. So irrespective of, irrespective of where you are and what you are or how labeled you are, I can learn from you. I can connect with you. And people on the whole feel that they're valued when you do that. Am I making any sense? To you, madam. Okay. You can say no or yes in this conversation. So now, in this conversation here, these I I say are currencies, right? That's what we need to do: shift away from what we think is supposed to be eldership, elders, what we think old people are, or what people are, or, or dying people, or what that whatever that is, and shift it back to actually what is a currency. And the currency is what you already have. That's why people come to you, sir, because you possess those those currencies. And it's a currency they can't buy because they don't know how to pay for it. And the only way they can pay for it is to come to you with humility and ask you for that. And that's a massive change. And we need to change the perception of that so that people can believe that as elders. Now let me play you another bit of, of, uh... let me just stop that one second. 
Um, what is important about this? You know, we talked about, I just said about currency. What happens when you don't believe in yourself? If you don't share the knowledge that you have? If you don't connect with people? If you are trapped in a particular way and programmed? Those are the sorts of things I need you to think about. Right? And right at the top, I talked about how elders are made children. So this is an important thing. And anybody, and you will know this, and we'll all come to you for, for the DVD. Okay. <laughs> sort of nonsense anymore. I don't like it here. I'm tired of being afraid all the time. I've decided not to stay. Okay. Film. What was the film? Shawshank Redemption. Who's seen the film? Beautiful. Good film. Yeah. The, the, the next bit. Um, That's right. Yeah. That's the bit I didn't show. <clears throat> it's a gruesome end. But when he talks about <coughs> home, he's talking about prison. That's what he's talking about. I could just shoot this person and do this and go back home. He's been programmed for so long in that space. We can't exist in the world. And one of the most impending lines, one of the most powerful lines is, I, I don't, I don't want to be continually being afraid. I think it's something. He's continually afraid of things he doesn't understand. And he's forced into a position where actually he's not in control. He's not recognized for anything. And the only thing he can do is to bring his life to an end. I guarantee you that when you see that film, when you get it, you probably get it for a pound or a couple of 
pounds or something. It has got to be in your DVD collection. It's a very powerful film. Basically, the man, uh, I find I've said America, but it seems to be a little start in the 80s, yes. and it's just about like, <coughs> surviving. But it's been totally conditioned by prison life. Yes. You can't adapt to the world, out, the world outside. So he's never trapped. He cannot, uh, help the public age and infirmity, uh, learn to cope with the world, uh, outside the prison. When he's released, Absolutely. he's doomed to, uh, the very media. Uh, existence until they finally figured out. How He's trapped you? in a cave, as Plato said, the cave of twilight existence, yes. where some of us, as Plato said, escape the cave and we were grow around and wink. Uh, now, I borrow my own analogy from Tadbob of that man's state, uh, to Brock of my father's state, being a civil servant and town, uh, counsellor, to I hope my state, my own right state, the short sighted dragon who's grown his wind. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Thank you again. Very powerful thing. You, were you going to say something? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What you said then, sorry. Yeah. Um, the thing that always gets me about that particular clip it is all about fear and programming and how, in effect, some of us still live in that prison that, is, that helps us and protects us. And it's an easy place to go back to because we don't know what we're going to meet outside. Remember I put that word up there? Um, that's something that's always hanging over our heads. Fear. What will happen? Remember at the beginning we talked about Going from an adult to an elder, fear. That's the thing that stops us in our tracks every time. To the point at which we don't know whose story or what story we're telling. Are we telling someone else's story or are we telling ours? So if we're telling somebody else's story, we're telling the story that reflects the institution. We're telling a story about our own inability to control challenge. We're saying that we don't have knowledge of ourselves. We're saying we have the inability to understand ourselves. We believe in fact, and this has got to be real. We, we promote fear because that's a way that we can feel at home. And we seek permission to make decisions. That's not our story. It's not my story. If you're going to be, in, if you're going to go through those cycles of eldership, actually, we need to tell a very different story because people need you. We cannot be promoting fear because remember that energy that we were talking about? If you start from fear in here, all you're going to do is, promote, is make other people fear. And you're going to be exacerbating that. But if you start from a position that actually I'm being fearless, you will give people permission not to, not to fear. Remember the thing we talked about that, that video clip we said at the beginning? Yeah. You give people permission. As an elder, if you are set up, if you are following those stages, you are giving people permission to do the thing that they were born to do. Can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Can you think of a situation where it would actually be good? Where it comes? So being afraid of something would actually help us. Being afraid of something. Being afraid is different from fear. And I give you the, I know it sounds like semantics, but it isn't. Um, I can be afraid of gliding, jumping in a glider. I can be afraid. But I'm not going to let that stop me from doing it. The fear is an actual action that prevents you from making that leap. So being afraid is important. It's an important 
biological reaction. But fear stops you and prevents you from making that thing a reality. Fear is the very thing that says, in a relationship, man, woman, I'm not going to do this because she might reject me. I'm not going to do this. How do you know this? In the work that I do around narrative coaching, it's about fear. If I do this, this is going to happen, and then that will happen, and then I will do this, and I'll lose my house, and then I'll, well, how do you know that? It's all in your head. That's the most powerful thing you have, and you're making it direct and stop you from doing the thing that you're supposed to be doing. So it's being mindful of the fear, and then being rational. Got it. Got it. Mindfulness. And that's about trusting yourself. Trusting who you are. Valuing who you are. You can be afraid, but don't let that stop you, because if you let that stop you, you give, you ensure that other people up, use that fear to stop themselves otherwise. People are coming to you because they have fear. That's what they're doing. I have fear. Help me. You say, yeah, it's okay to have fear. But actually, let's look at the reality. That's the approach. Does that make any sense, sir? Because there's a, you see the film after a yes. person who has this thesis that um, danger is real, but fear is just consumes. That's what I was thinking. Hey, yeah. perfect. Absolutely perfect. Yeah. It's a great film, if anybody can watch it. Lots of different levels. It's brilliant. It was, it was Doreen. <laughs> Doreen, you are the film buff. I am the aspects. Hey. And part of it yeah. is uh, ingrained fear. Yes. Uh, born with fear. A yes. nine year old is just from watching it, born with it. Yes. Now, as soon as man, I went to do a feature on foreign countries, I forced her <coughs> to peer over a parapet no higher than this table, and I felt tremendous vertigo. I went to and fro, to and fro with my cameras with a crowd of people present until <coughs> so I'd taken enough photograph of the feature. Did he drop below? And I realised that I was born with it here and I was on to conquer it. So I peered over many a precipice with camera, through the uh, viewfinder with camera, click, uh, retreat, wind on, forward again, elbows on the edge of the precipice, click, and repeatedly until I got dozens of photographs over precipices, and I'm proud of them that I took them. I developed the film, I've done it, the pictures in my dark room in total darkness, RA4, and I'm afraid of and I'm afraid of people. That is social vertigo, and I come here to conquer it, because the more I mix with people, the more I can conquer my social fears of those from the way my father treated me and from what my inmate endowment. So okay. I'd like to lead you up Chapel Crag or in the other department and peer over the precipice and come and peer together. Okay. Let's come and peer together. Sir. Yeah. All right. Okay. Good. Good. I would. The only thing I would say, sir, is that we're not born with fear. We learn it. We learn how to be fearful and stuff. Uh, and it's 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 necessary. We're taught to be fearful because it's necessary for other structures to exist. My son came back to me one day and he said, his, te- his physics teacher was teaching him something. And he said to his physics teacher, that doesn't make any sense. Because I know that um, I've seen that you can do different things in zero gravity. And his teacher said to him, no, that's not so. And he stood up to the teacher and said, no, I think you're wrong. The teacher said, well, you need to go to the head. He came back to me and said, this is what he said. He said, okay, all right, I'm not going to get involved. And his mother said, well, you should be down there at school. You should be, ah, and I said, no, I'm not going to get involved. Because if I get involved, then he's not going to take responsibility. So I said, okay, what you do is you write an essay proving what you, what you understand. And you give it to the head. And you ask the head to mark it. Because he was responsible. So he did it. He gave it to the head. The head gave him an A. 
He went back to the teacher and he said, you know that thing you were talking about? I still think you're wrong. Thank you. He's taking responsibility for that. Why? Because I said, you might be fearful, but you've got what it takes. And I'm giving you permission to go and make that happen. Now he doesn't have that fear. Deconstruct it, little by little. It's not going to happen over there. Thank you very much. So, remember we talked about how the elder becomes child. The elder is a concept clashes with society's concepts. All right? So we're talking about a lot of this idea of elder is based upon economics, all right? Skills required, knowledge. So if you're no longer important, remember we, remember we talked about currency. Now we're bringing currency back to money. So people are seen as a, as a commodity. And if you're seen as a commodity, then you can be used in a particular way. So it's not about the currency of knowledge, blah, 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 blah. If you exist in this particular society, what you're going to be faced is you're going to be faced with that. And as an elder or as a child, you're going to be forced to do particular things and think particular ways. That zip is about keeping you quiet as an elder. The currencies required for eldership cannot be acknowledged. Assimilation of external cultures takes significance at the expense of cultural values and community stories. Okay, an example of that is, I was speaking to uh, one, of, one of my, I said clients, one of the people I'm working with as a narrative coach, and um, he said to me, I felt completely useless all right. I've been doing this job for 20 years, and then this young person comes in and completely undermines me. Now, if this was structured where we had elders, that young person would come in and ask him, can you help me understand what this is? So the structure that we're working with doesn't actually support what should happen in order to make the society work properly. I'm making sense here. Yeah, so. The bit I have a slight difficulty with yes, in go relation ahead. to this, and it's it's around the word elder in a sense yeah. itself, because it, that, that has an implication about yes. age. Yes. And to some extent, that's what you're talking about. People get older and their role in society might change. But I've always thought that eldership and age were only correlated, but not necessarily causal. In other words, not all people who are older are elders. And not all elders are older. Yeah. But it's actually something about the contribution that you make and the way you make that contribution. And this sort of notion that simply aging itself produces changes seems to me to be a different argument than the argument about eldership. What I'm saying here is that to be an elder, you have to start from birth. And the contribution is clear. So I'm teaching my son to be an elder. So when he gets to whatever age he will, he will get to, he'll be able to give that information back. It doesn't just happen when you're 50, I'm now an elder, because it's a process you have to go through. It is not something that you get to 60 or 50 or 45 or 70, and all of a sudden you're an elder. Because part of what, you need to, what we need to be doing as a community is changing how people think when they're a child. Yes, and you're absolutely right. There are people who are 60 who have difficulty understanding what their role is, much less understanding what they have to give. And there are young people at 25 that are very clear about what it is they need to do. And in the Sioux nations, they would say it's not actually about age, it's about what you understand. And if you look at the Dalai Lama, you can be 10. Yeah? But you still have to go through a process of understanding who you are and what you have to give and trusting yourself. All that cycle you have to go through in order to become 
Yeah, I mean, I accept that. I also accept that there's inevitably a degree of correlation between the age and relationship sure. because at some extent you have to experience the sure. world to understand sure. it. Sure. But I was, I was just a bit concerned about you when know, you're talking about, for example, at work when a new young person comes in and takes over the older person's job. I'm not sure that's got anything to do with the eldership. Well, that's, that's got to do with society's attitude to age rather than the eldership. Absolutely. I'm just using that as an example. Yeah. Like I've used many, many examples. Um, where what I'm, what I'm, I'm positing is that there are structures that actually don't allow the elder to become an elder. Because if an elder, if that happened, then the whole structure couldn't exist. It would start to change. And no one's going to change that structure because that structure fits into something else. And that needs to stay the same. So yes, I understand your argument. Um, that, that was just, I could have had a number of different exercises, a number of different things that I could have raised there. But we have, a, we have a structure within which we're working and we have to be very careful that we have to see what that structure is doing. Because within that structure, we still have young people that need support. We still have other people that need our knowledge. We have all that. And it's on the rare occasion when people can come to us and say, can you help? On those occasions, we're realizing our worth but I think you're right, so I mean, I, 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 I accept that. I accept that. As a society, we all lost respect for our elders. You, yeah. You know, we lost respect for these people who are evil. Yeah. Respect I think it's it's fundamental to the society because if you if 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 one of the things I'm, I hope I'm not dragging you too far away, but fundamentally. As a society, we, if we respected, if we understood that those things were important to our society, if we recognized that those are currencies that we valued, certain things would not happen in society. And young people, to my, this is my understanding, young people don't value elders because they're taught not to. My sons would never, ever call me Eli in public or even at home. Never do it. They call me dad. Because I am saying there is a difference. There is a difference between me and you. Do you think that if someone doesn't fall apart that, that they're going to be less respected? No. That's not what I said. What I'm saying is there's a recognition of difference. Is a child that's still recognised as part or even set that, for example, um, my friend, uh, um, the daughter, it was a stepdaughter. Mm -hmm. She called him vice versa. Okay. That doesn't mean that she disrespects him less. Yeah. He's not called that. Okay. This is I my culture. I understand. My cultural view is that there is a difference. Yeah, there is a difference. Um, <coughs> that person being called Simon, or she would not disrespect him. I doubt that that would ever happen. I don't know the person. But what she's learning, she's learning that actually there's a difference between that person and me. And there are certain things that I need to do differently when I'm around that person than I do with my friend. And I'm sure she wouldn't say, you know, hi, bruv, to her friend or her sister or whatever she says and say the same thing to her stepfather. And that's exactly what you're saying. There is learn to respect. You get to learn those things. Those things get to be learned at a very young age. Now, if we give our children eight hours a day in a school, and the school doesn't engender creativity and understanding and respect, etc., we've only ourselves to blame, really. And I, I'm sorry if that seems a bit harsh, but we are within structures that we need to take responsibility for, to some extent. Because when the children come back to us, obviously, we need to be able to say, what did you learn today? How did you learn that? Be interested. Trying to find out, giving them permission to say, yeah, I didn't understand that. Helping them to do that. This is an active situation because they're going to learn how to do that to their children. So the very process that we go through, they will learn. So, questions. You first, madam, and then you, sir. 
small question that just emailed it. It's um, the coming in here in this day and age, I think the welfare everyone has a place in society where the grandparents, parents, the next generation, we all live together and they all have an important role. And like what you said, I would call my older siblings or cousins or people older than me with a respectful term. We do call them by their name because there is this respectful name which has brought this freedom in this world. And that came to everyone in society. What I see in the Western world and now it's spread everywhere is compartmentalizing. The productive people and the rest are useless. So it's very young and useless, and very old and useless. And it, it, there is nothing about Western compassion and connected with. It's all about converting your skills into cash. Wow. Thank you. That's that's a that's a succinct word of the last forty five minutes. Thank you. Madam, I, sorry, I agree, I agree. Go on. Uh, on a very similar point, it just, just so happens that I was thinking, is it a case that we uh, sense of identity? That, that we, I, I work with lots of young people in, in charity and grief at Concrete as well as um, um, community arts, where as, as young people, they're completely baffled on their identity. So if you don't have the identity with broken families and with people who are like around them, you're not going to gain respect. You're still searching for it. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the it's the bit about the empty bag can't stand up. Right? So what you're trying to do is trying to fill that bag up from the from the child. You're trying to teach, you're trying to get child to experience, you're trying to do all sorts of things. You're trying to to allow that child to go through a process where they can take somebody else through a process. And, but you have to go through the process yourself. You cannot do it. And this idea of, um, I mean, this is a debate about rubbish on the outside and the, the economic bit on the inside. Um, but I think the idea of having a role in society, having a value, having a, a, a responsibility is quite key. If I have a role at 70, and I have a role at 50, and I have a role at six, and I have a role at two, whatever that role is, obviously it changes and just like a butterfly. I have a place. There is something I can value. If I have no role, I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing. I have no purpose. Then things can get quite fuzzy because you're not standing up. You're not grounding yourself into something. And when you know, when we're working with young people, young people need to stand somewhere because they're always searching. You need to stand somewhere. And if they're not standing anywhere, then as a youth worker, we've got to stand next to them to find it. Yeah, that's right. And as a youth worker, that's one of the most powerful things we do. We'll say, we'll help you find where you're going. And they keep bouncing back and forth to us until they found where they're going and they go. That's a really critical piece of work that we're doing. So really, the elder becomes child by you're not telling your story. You're telling your story and not the stories that are around you. You're, you're giving. Right? You're giving versus taking. Right? And you're not unlocking the capital resources. You're not unlo unlocking that perfection. right? Because you are perfect. You have all that stuff within you. So, uh, this is a very simplistic way of looking at it. But actually, never break out of that child state. You never do that. Because you're not giving anybody permission because you haven't got permission yourself. You're not grounding anybody because you're not grounding, you haven't got the grounding yourself. You're not recognizing your value because you're not sure that what you've got is of value. So actually, all your currencies are based on somebody else's story and not the one that you cultivated for yourself. Or within your group. And this just reinforces a particular situation that you have no role. Mm -hmm. 
That's quite a dangerous place. And I put this slide up because I know it's quite controversial. And I'm surprised that hands haven't gone up. I think this is a function of capitalism and Yeah, that's one of the, definitely one of those things. Definitely one of those things. Um, we are, we are taught not to think for ourselves. It's a very subtle thing. Very subtle thing. Even when we know that things are wrong, we still do it. You could argue that you just don't have to listen. Oh, of course you could. Yeah, absolutely. No, I don't think there are enough substitutes. <laughs> of course, there is, no, there is no current large-scale substitute for capitalism. I guess you know. I'm not talking about capitalism. I'm talking about when um, someone who told you that you're talking about, you can't just say, which I think is what you're trying to, the whole premise, is that you can just say, well, I'm not going to listen. The basis rather, of, rather, rather than having the struggle, you can just say, well, I'll just go over here. Okay. Now, the basis for that, yeah, the basis for that, and I'm, I'm taking both bits here, all right? The basis for being able to say, I'm not listening, is that you've been, you've been given the substance to be able to say that. Yeah? So, I can say, you know what, I'm not eating that. And the reason I'm not eating that is because I know what that's coming from. Yeah? But if I have no knowledge about that, I will eat it. And I will do myself damage. The thing around capitalism is that they want you to do that. All right? We're set up to hear stories. So every, if you look at the way that marketing is at the moment, they're using a lot of storytellers, by the way, to do their advertising. So you'll see lots of stories happening in the adverts now. It's not buy this, it will help you. It's this person did this amazing thing. And having done that, do you know what happened? They actually drank this coffee. Now, actually, we're not selling the coffee. We're selling the person who's actually done this. And the amazing thing that they've done is doing this. And they just happen to be drinking coffee or McDonald's or KFC or do you know where that, sorry, but do you know where that came from? Why the advertising changed to tell the story? Do you like to hear the story? Yes, look, story? please, please. Okay, in the 1920s, during the Great um, Recession, when the, the banks fell down and everybody lost the job and there was a big problem, there was a person called um, Edward Bernay, and advertising at that time was just instructional. So if you were to buy this table, the table that the advert would just say, Wooden table, four legs, where the wood was bought, or what the wood was, um, essentially was pine or whatever, and then the dimensions of it. And then what Edward Bernay realised was that, um, he had a famous uncle, um, and, um, he said that people are ruled by their emotions. So, if you want to sell something to someone, you have to not necessarily give them instructions on how things may work, well, the dimensions, you have to appeal to their emotions. So that's when adverts started to tell a story so that people had a connection with it. And his, um, his uncle was um, Sidney Freud, the great psychologist. So that's where that came from. So essentially, it's you have to thank Sidney Freud for adversing now. Thank you very much for that. Hey. <laughs> and I think one of the things that, can I just, may I just respond to that? That's what I, I, there's a couple of people. We can yeah. go on forever and ever, and I know that we've got, we, we need to be looking at time. But what's interesting, sir, about that is that I have got some friends who spend, who said, who identify themselves as business storytellers. That's what they do. They rent them. And their setup is to help business make money by doing exactly that. Yeah? So the IKEA commercial now is trying to get people locked into it. The, one of the best commercials out at the moment, and I say best because it's, it's, it's so good that the product makes no sense. The product is just an, an add-on. Coca-Cola. Brilliant. Brilliant commercial. You know, at the moment, what happens is you say, I've got this friend that I'm sharing this with, and I found this friend, and at the end of the day, you've got all these slides of father and and father and son, father and son, father. This is, this is what happened. We drank it when we listened, and this is how it kept us in relationships. So you're seeing this advert, which is about relationships. It's not about a sugary drink. It's about relationships. 
great storytelling. The use, the buying power of Coca-Cola has gone up by 15% because of that. We're talking millions, millions of millions of units being sold as a result of those sort of commercials. Thank you for that. That's really, really helpful. Very, very helpful. Thank you. Um, one, two. Did you put your hand up? No, you didn't. One, two. Can I have you, Madam, first, and then your son? So the responsibility is being given to an outside body. Yeah. And um, and that outside body that you listen to return it's not about you, it's about what they can do to make money for themselves. So the more brainless you are, the better you serve their purpose. And that content of faith is about this again related to responsibility. When I was growing up in South India, we were never really taught to take care of ourselves. We were taught to be responsible and take care of everyone else around us. <coughs> and um, I found out the hard way that it was difficult when I was in the US to do that when you're ill, you, you everybody else around you takes care of you, <coughs> whereas in, the, in, the, in another country, <coughs> you're expected to take care of yourself, you're in, you have to get to the hospital, whether it's like on the ambulance or anything else, it's not the society that takes care of you. And the good thing about being responsible for others is you find that since everyone around you taking care of you, you don't have to worry about taking care of you. You can learn to be fearless. Yeah. So, one of the difficulties we all do grow and the power of control and authority to change the behavior. Yes. And very often we do by the, the elders and the adults to control young people who stifle them. And of course, if you are a father <coughs> and of course a female, very often we have rules that we are allocated. And uh, one of the things that that explains to me it seems to be that the younger people are me. Uh, I'm not saying it's all the young people. It's young fine, people. that's okay. Uh, yeah. Talent, the establishment, and I think that's quite helpful. Oh, I agree with you entirely, entirely. The young people are the ones that are going to answer the questions that we can't do. <coughs> you know, they're going to want to ask the question, what if? Yeah. My son came home and we redesigned a whole uh, a, 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 a new type of Hoover. I said, "Great, that's great. I'd invest in that. Brilliant." They're going to ask the question, "What if?" I can't ask those questions. Yeah. What if? What if I have the power? Absolutely, absolutely. Part of our job, as you said, is, is transferring that. And saying you have, let's give you a voice, yeah. Let's change, challenge you. Let's not let us not just let's not just have this voice as a youth council and then a youth group and a youth. Let's go out there and really challenge somebody and say, actually, no, I think that's wrong. Sometimes that would be the patronising of you living things, right? And maybe they would be healthier if they were taking it for themselves rather than being. In this, uh, I know that you're. Um, Sorry, you want to say something? Yeah, right? yeah go ahead. Sorry, so no, I was, was going to say, I, I, home work never patronizing, but I think it's not to lead, it, it's to guide, and that's not very. No. I'm not that in, in any shape of the world, but I, it's, yeah, to. It is that It is to guide. The human psyche, I believe, is based on curiosity and imagination and creativity. And, and not by being artful or theatrical, I, I am, but they, it's to seek, see, and do. And so even if you've got all the capitalism in the world and 
all the chit chats and go to programs and you're trying to avoid it. You know, it's it's to, your subconscious thought is you might be saying no, I'm going to walk the other side of the street, but your subconscious thought is saying oh. <laughs> and then, yeah. yeah. So it's, so part of our, part of, yeah, absolutely. Part of our responsibility is to guide. I'm not going to deny that. And, it, and all the way through the beginning of this conversation, it was about that. Definitely. This is a story. I love the story. Fantastic. Can I tell you that, please? Yes. Can I tell you? Okay. <clears throat> this is not my story. It's a story by a man I have great respect for, Khalil Kibran. Who's aware of Khalil Kibran? Brilliant. One of the one of the most amazing person. Khalil, in his story, he says, I was walking with my friend, and my friend pointed out that in front of me there was a blind man sitting on a temple, sitting outside the stairs of his temple. And he said, He is the most the wisest man in this land. I said, Wow, I've got to go and speak to him. So I went over and I sat next to him and I said, Sir, I don't mean to be rude, but when were you blind? He said, I was blind from birth. Wow. And what is it that you do here? He said, I'm an astronomer. He said, really? And the blind man lifted his hand and placed it on his chest and said, I see all these suns and moons and stars. Powerful story. Because actually what he's talking about is actually the stuff within you. He's tapping into the, the understanding that he has within him. Doesn't need his eyes to see. He understands it from here. Remember, I was talking about being. See that word? What was that word up there, sir? Absolutely. You were saying we learn if people are looking after each other, you learn to be fearless. You have a role and a function. You learn to be fearless, and when you are fearless. You give other people permission to be fearless. Blind man. Fearless. So I'm going to go through these very quickly. And I did say it was about um, the Matrix. I'm a big Matrix fan, so please bear with me. Just check what that is. Okay. All right. Well, I'll have to tell you what that is. Um, in this bit here, um, there's Morpheus and Neo. You, you know this bit, don't you? Morpheus and Neo. And Morpheus says to Neo, if you really want to find out about what's happening, I'll give you one or two pills. One's the blue pill, and then there's the red pill. We take one, I'll see, I'll tell you how far this rabbit hole goes. We take the other one, you go back to your life, and you wake up in the morning, and all this will be a dream. And then Neil goes to the one, he says, remember, you've got to pick the right one for you. We're all in that stage at this point. We're at that stage where we're picking the unknown or the bit we're comfortable with. I'm saying at this point in our life, at this point, if we're heading towards that place of eldership, we've got to start going down the rabbit hole because otherwise we are still perpetuating our own fears. And if we perpetuate our own fears, that word still hangs above our head. And it will continue to until we rub it off. Does that make any sense? This is one of my favorite pictures. I don't know how much time I've got, but I'm going to, I'm going to start winding up a little bit. Love this picture. Brilliant. Who's seen this picture before? No? Okay. Well, you've seen it now. It's great. This is an elephant. That's it. Perfect. This elephant, um, in the, the story goes that this elephant is huge. It's huge. The chain is not that strong. It could walk away from that at any point. 
But what it was, it was chained, it was chained in that way when it was very, very young. And so it's learnt that it can't walk away from it. It's learnt that it cannot break free of its own chains. It's no different to us, really. Remember, we, the whole session today, conversation was about programming. We're programmed into this space where actually we think we can't do something. We believe we can't do something. And we create the fantasies around why we can't do something. And then when somebody says it, we create all these excuses. Fear. It's become so real that we actually believe it exists. Absolutely believe it exists. I can't draw. Who's told you that? Well, I'm, but you've drawn a stick, man. That's drawing. Yeah, but it's not. But what are you comparing yourself to? This is you. This is how you deliver stuff. We believe it to the extent that we trap ourselves in the thing that cannot do it. And so we become genuinely unhealthy. The stuff we put in and the stuff we put on. Very simple. The stuff we put in us is the recognition. We start all that experience and understanding, all that stuff that we put in us. If we add it to what we put on, which is this clarity, this ability to give permission, to, to give knowledge, gives us a very clear general health. We become healthy, we make other people feel healthy. Now, this is just summation of the whole thing, really. So, power of the elder. We recognize that there is a universe, we recognize the present, we recognize the past. We recognize ourselves, our ancestors in the future. We recognize that we have a relationship to all these things. That makes us extremely powerful people. Very powerful. Because we recognize we have a role in these things. The past, because we recognize we have a, what we are doing now is historical. We recognize that actually I have a role to play. We recognize that people came before me, so therefore I have a way of extending that knowledge or changing that knowledge and creating a different future. So if you have a recognition for all these things, it makes you quite powerful. There's this question formulating in your head. Is there a question formulating in your head? Yes. yes. Um, not a specific one. Okay. I can see the question. I can see the question. When it's ready, can you let it pop out? Okay. All right. Brilliant. Okay. So transmitting this elder knowledge, it exists, right? This is a process and it goes through community and it goes through sharing and it, it doesn't just start when, at, at an age specific point. It's at the beginning. So you learn how to be you learn your role. You learn how you can do things differently. You learn how to be fearless. You learn to answer those questions. What if people validate whatever it is you've got to do to help you grow, to help you do things, to help you become something else? It's a process that actually requires no money. There's no money in this. The currency is us. We are the we are the resource and we are the currency. One billion pounds could not buy what we've got in this room. Couldn't happen. It's not even I couldn't even use the word priceless in that because priceless in itself has a defined nature. It's beyond that. And that's why it's a privilege to even speak to you today. Because I'm speaking to thousands of years of knowledge and understanding. And sometimes I just have to be quiet and listen. 
So here, I'm standing, standing with your back against the ban banyan tree. Yeah. Banyan tree. This is the banyan tree. The community is the banyan tree. The people that I am with, banyan. I don't stand here and talk to you. There are hundreds of people behind me that are helping me to talk to you right now. <coughs> I was saying to Alex that I spent the last 19 years with my, my cousin researching my own family tree. And we're back to 1750. We've got lots more work to do. We now, this on Sunday, will be our fifth family conference. We've got about 300 people connected to us. That takes a huge amount of work and commitment. But when those children are in a community, I'm not saying the community is always great, you have to work at it. Just like any marriage or any relationship, you have to work at it. But in that community of 300 people, that child is being supported. That three-year-old can run anywhere around that space and every adult, every adult male is a father. Every adult, every adult female is a mother. So you don't need to worry. That is a wonderful free freedom. It's wonderful. You've got a four-year-old child who will blow things up by mistake or do things or write on walls or whatever. But to find that you've got X amount of adults out there that will look after that child in a similar way that you would do, that's so freeing. That's such a, a weight lifted above your head. That's not respite care. That's a care from within. That's a love that you can't, you can't, you can't buy that. Everything I've told you today that I found is not about money. It's about how we reprogram ourselves. How we change our own focus and how we show real love and commitment to each other by dealing with that for ourselves. So, I'd like to end by saying thank you very, very, very much for the time you've given me, for, for your love and support, for listening, for asking questions, uh, for giving me the opportunity to be able to say these things in front of you. Um, and also, I'd like to thank you, sir, for, and, and yourself, for giving me some education today. Yeah. I really hope that, that I've done some good today. I really hope that I'm able to share that some, some of whatever I've said may have been of some help to you. So thank you. Thank you, Shalai. That was uh, fantastic. Uh, everybody, there's plenty of food, and please help yourself to food and get refreshments. You're going to have a short break, and uh, hopefully, Dina might arrive from the, the train station. But if not, uh, if anybody else has something to share, Please do. Otherwise, I might give you a potted history of natural law, going back to Aristotle, <laughs> and up to uh, uh, Martin Luther King. Oh, that's, uh, yeah. I can catch your show. I think this this man here has got some information. Can you give that this to uh, yeah, now, uh, If you can open the both both arms. Uh, uh, this is all this after several times. I uh, nearly done both. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. Uh, well, Mr. Anderson, uh, 
It's a very erratic way of naming documents, like often that the character's name is the same name. The native supplies, uh, Mac Trike, that opens the story about Manny, Manny, Manny. Okay. You know, the change names to real people. Uh, and then the place name, real Manny Marie. Uh, and then the essay for you called uh, Three Score Years oh, and Twelve, which was for you just before I arrived. Uh, so if I uh, got the apparatus to transfer... Oh, no, if, you, if you gave it to, um, to, to Alex, yeah. if you give it to him, he'd be able to, uh, okay. to do that while it's just passing to me. Yes. Uh, uh, about six or seven people I'm interested in. Okay. The essay I wrote expressly for you about uh, wanting to come to the school of something who seem to have done further in the far gospel. Uh, what I offer was truly the Sunday talk books where people go to the beauty spots, enjoy them, uh, making the beauty spot complete, making photographs, uh, and then talking about what follows them. And then uh, my expertise in photography, per se, my moral argument, which is how we approach the French charges of people, and then uh, about that life, where she applies to her The idea that she really good. You find statues of people and uh, they unlike the face in your head. You don't know this is where a certain place is going to be born. And we went to Ledbury, uh, met John Maysfield, the poet, an airbus pioneer at Longwood. And the memorial for that guy who died in the war at Dittenfire, double barrel religion structure, statue on the fence. I don't say more about this guy. Oh, is it 16? Oh, I apologise. I apologise. I'm glad that was a big jump. No, it's great. 16%. Really? Really? Yeah. 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 No, but it's good. It's good. You know, it's, it's good when I'm saying something that people that can see you, that can very fun. It's great. It's amazing how that, how that story has gone through that you guys have shown. It's amazing. Thank you, sir. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you.
Well, she, she one of the things I about is the perfection of the perfection of the and particularly when you're dealing with other people, particularly with the chase to do with the one of the things that's reassuring to me is that I'm not perfect. So, you know, one of the things that is um, the only way to do it. When I say perfect, it's being accepted of the I don't think we have people so this idea of everything is fine. That everything is fine. So I know what you guys are going to do. I I had not in previous things. Because the key yeah. thing about the astronaut is that as yeah. he becomes an adult, he absorbs it. He becomes a child again. Yeah. <laughs> and there's something quite magical about that. Is the notion that the point at which you suddenly realise that knowing all these things is not the end. The whole new beginning starts from that. Is that is the best. <laughs> The elder, the child, the grandfather, grandfather, Thank <laughs> you. 
Oh, which one? Okay. That's um that's pretty good that you're doing, right? Very good. How old is it? Oh, well done. That's good. That's really good. Oh, sorry. I forgot about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah.